Uh, let's see. We'll start in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, Christos Anesti, I hope everybody's having a nice first week of the Holy 50 Days. Um, do you know why we say Christ is risen, truly he is risen, over and over for every greeting? Um, <clears throat> and I, I think it's a little bit related to the gospel reading of today. Um, the, the greeting that we have for Christ is risen, truly he is risen, it's to proclaim the good news that our Lord Jesus Christ has defeated sin and death. And I think that by constantly exchanging this greeting, it helps us reinforce the message that it, indeed Christ truly is risen. In other words, by repeating it over and over, uh, it helps us personally dispel any and all doubt about it. And that leads us to uh, the gospel reading of today. And hopefully, you read it uh, before the call. It comes from J on John chapter 20. And if you didn't read it before the call, that's okay. I would highly recommend that you read it after the call before Sunday school starts. <clears throat> but it's the second part of that chapter. Um, the first part of the chapter we read uh, for the resurrection, but um, we continue on this Sunday with the remaining part of the chapter. And there's, there's actually kind of two parts to this uh, gospel passage. Um, and it splits around verse 24. Yeah. So from 19 to 24, uh, we'll talk about that specifically. But then from 24 on, we talk about Thomas, St. Thomas. And, and we know this gospel reading. Um, last week when we heard, and this in John chapter 20, we heard about our Lord's resurrection. And we heard how Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room for the first time. And the apostles were amazed they were completely amazed and they couldn't believe it but we know that their eyes didn't see, deceive them christ was truly risen uh our faith is first and foremost about the uh, about christ rising from the dead and destroying death itself we're talking about you know the ultimate victory of good over evil right life over death uh christ over satan saint paul actually he put it very bluntly he says <clears throat> that if the resurrection isn't true, then our faith is meaningless. <clears throat> In other words, if the resurrection is just a fairy tale, then we Christians are the greatest fools of all because we believe in a lie. Um, he goes on to say in, in different words, but he says, if Christ isn't risen, then we're all dead in our sins. Basically, that instead of trying to live a disciplined, Christ-centered life of love, uh, and and uh, Christ-centered uh, focus that we should just eat and drink and you know enjoy the moment, but we know this is far from the truth. <clears throat> and so it leads us to to Saint Thomas. I think Saint Thomas gets a bad reputation. I think because he's been titled you know doubting Thomas or uh, all that kind of stuff about the resurrection. The label doubting Thomas, <clears throat> it's it's a familiar term, and in fact. I think it's been said that that term has been used for anyone who's a skeptic for anything, not just matters of the faith, but for anything. So we have to be careful that before we start to step on our pedestal and look down on St. Thomas, we have to analyze the gospel reading a little bit um, more carefully. But before we do that, I want to talk about <clears throat> the faith of a child and how our Lord Jesus Christ puts on a pedestal the unconditional trust of a child, it's, it's held up to the ideal. And this is what we strive for. He mentions in Matthew chapter 18, uh, verse 2, Then Jesus called a little child to him and set, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Sometimes um, kids, they ignore evidence to their belief because of their hope, right? They don't question, um, <clears throat> they don't question to the details that some adults do. Maybe it's because it's more fun. Maybe it's because it's more joyful to believe than to doubt. <clears throat> but in any case, the faith of a child is, is held up to the standard here. And then we come to St. Thomas. And St. Thomas is presented, we're presented with a person who stands in, in contrast of that faithful, trusting child. And we know in context that 
eight days earlier, uh, Christ appeared to the disciples, but except for St. Thomas, and, but they told him about it. And how did he respond? Did he say like, oh, that's wonderful. I can't wait to see him. No, he was given the title Doubting Thomas by saying in verse 25 of today's gospel, unless I see the mark of nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. He kind of draws the line in the sand. But before we talk about St. Thomas uh, in depth, uh, starting at verse 25, I want to take the beginning part to the, of the gospel passage, starting at uh, gospel, uh, verse 19. And we notice that the resurrected Christ gives us two gifts. What were those two gifts? You know, before we, I, I want to spend a little bit of time on this before we get to verse 24. Um, you know, as the disciples and the, like, they, they looked amazed at the, the risen Christ and they couldn't believe it, that Christ was truly risen and they were filled with hope. And if you look at the beginning parts of that chapter or that, that beginning part of that section, starting at verse 19, we see in three different occasions that our Lord gives the first gift, which is peace. When our Lord greets his disciples with the word of peace, um, he states to them what he brings to them. In other words, we see that God can overcome every obstacle that separates me from him. He, and he enters through the locked doors. Sometimes we close the doors of our hearts. And maybe it's due to anxiety. Maybe it's worry. Maybe it's doubt, right? But the gospel message of today reminds us that our Lord brings peace to our lives through his love for us. So whatever is causing us anxiety, whatever is causing us uh, to distrust or to worry, we have to remember that the first, um, one of the first gifts that he gives is peace. In, in the Psalms, it's said that the Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. We have, to, we have to really believe in these promises that are very clear cut. The strength and the peace that he gives to his people is victory. And in doing this, he restores mankind to the state that God had intended for man. And so what is the reward for complete faith as a child? It's calmness. It's peace. And we're not talking about the peace that you get when you sit on the beach in Mexico. You know, it's not that kind of peace and not that kind of calm. We're talking about the inner peace, the inner calmness within our hearts um, when everyone and everything around us seems to be in chaos. That's the peace that God uh, promises us. The second gift is the power to forgive sins. <clears throat> Oftentimes, we wonder why we have to come to the church to confess our sins to a priest. And even different denominations and different uh, religious uh, groups will say, that you don't need to confess to a priest, you need to just confess to God in private. And oftentimes we're told that the sacrament and the mystery of confession is a creation of man and it's not based in scripture. And as we can see from the, from the couple of verses that I put here, just as an example, that can't be more farther from the truth. Um, we can see from the gospel that it's, it's through the forgiveness of sins that man is restored to peace and harmony with God. And so it's a continuation of the first gift by uh, allowing us and giving the disciples the power to forgive sins. Again, he reiterates the point of peace. And so um, it's through this sacrament of confession that we're taken out of conflict and separation from God and we're restored to our intended, uh, intended created nature. And so it's important to understand where we get um, the institution of the sacraments. And so at this point, the gospel turns our attention to the disbelief and the faith of, of Thomas. And this starts in around verse 24. And we know that Thomas was not present when he appeared, when our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to the others. And when the others told St. Thomas about it, we have seen the Lord. He said what, in verse 25, what future generations would, uh, you know, represent all skeptics from, from then on. Tom, St. Thomas demanded proof of the risen Christ. He says, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. He says, unless I see, I will not believe. Unless I see, I will not believe. And I think a lot of us can relate to St. Thomas. I think a lot of us put conditions on our belief. 
We put conditions on our trust in Christ. Sometimes we bargain with God. We say, you know, Lord, if you'll do this for me, then I'll believe. Then I'll be a servant. Then I'll go to church. Then I'll pray, right? Then I'll give money to the church. and I'll give money to the poor, right? And I, I think this comes from uncertainties and doubts. Uh, maybe we have to ask the question out loud, is it okay for a Christian to have such doubts? Our Lord says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. St. Thomas came to belief not because he touched God, but because God touched him. And so we have to ask, what does that mean for us to touch God and to be touched by God? Uh, to touch God and to be touched by him is to have some experience that takes us beyond and outside of ourselves to something greater than our little selves. It takes us to God, the creator. Um, I assume that each one of us is listening uh, at this gospel passage, this contemplation, because at some time, somewhere, the risen Christ has appeared to us or spoken to us or has touched our hearts in some dramatic and moving way. Either that or we are looking for the risen Christ and we're waiting for him to do the same for us. You know, we can believe based on the witnesses of others uh, not necessarily based on our own experiences. Um, and this is uh, the very belief that grants us life. I was going to say that doubt is kind of like uh, the coronavirus. I was going to use that example, but I thought that was a bit too extreme. I don't think doubt is like the coronavirus. It's not that serious, right? Doubt is more like a cold. Uh, if we have it for a week, it's not that bad. And maybe we'll even be stronger with immunity for the future. But if we let doubt linger and we let it set in for several weeks, it could be fatal. It could be serious. And so this Sunday gospel of today, the gospel of St. Thomas, it reminds us of the important lesson about doubts that linger in our minds. You know, doubt is part of our journey of faith. Yet we have to ask ourselves, what kind of doubt do we harbor? There's different types of doubt. There's rebellious doubt. Um, rebellious doubt finds its root in our ego and our pride. Um, in other words, we don't want to believe. We think that we're above such foolish faith. Um, many so-called great thinkers of our age, they don't want to believe in the resurrection. They don't want to believe in an almighty God. They don't want to think of anything greater than the human mind. And you know, it doesn't matter what evidence that you give them, they prefer to reject anything that doesn't fit into human logic. And this, is, this rebellious doubt has no value in our spiritual journey. So I pray that we don't have this rebellious doubt, this doubt that comes from ego. Um, then there's wavering doubt. Wavering doubt comes in moments of weakness. Uh, we don't want to doubt, but we may allow different thoughts to enter our minds during temptations or moments of weakness. Um, and we express this doubt in issues of faith. So this doubt has value in only reminding us that we are weak and how the devil can play. And um, the devil can tempt us to lead us astray. Uh, so we should address this doubt, right? We should address this doubt with humility, guarding our minds and guarding our hearts while still seeking answers from God. Questions and doubt is not bad as long as we are sincerely seeking out the answers. Our Lord said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Christ offers absolute truth. The question is whether we will take the time and make the effort to seek the ultimate truth or you know, to simply accept the cynicism that modern uh, society provides. The, the third type of doubt is honest doubt. And this doubt comes to someone who is uncertain, but they admit that that they, they haven't necessarily examined every side of the argument. So although this person expresses doubt, they still remain, to be proved, uh, uh, remain open to be proved wrong. They remain open to faith. They remain open to God's love and to, and to the Holy Spirit. And so they may not be sure, but they're humble enough to learn. They're, they're humble enough to be corrected. And so we have to ask ourselves, do we hunger and do we desire to learn something new and to grow in our faith? So which type of doubt did St. Thomas have? Did he have the rebellious doubt, the wavering doubt, or the honest doubt? And I think, you know, 
I think that St. Thomas had the third type of doubt, the honest doubt. He questioned the truth of the resurrection because, you know, if you put yourself in his shoes, he saw the most gruesome death. He saw our Lord on the cross, right? He, 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 was, he was with him with the preaching and the miracles and all that kind of stuff. And then he saw him die on the cross. And so he questioned the truth of the resurrection because he saw a, a horrible death. But he still remained open to being proved wrong. In fact, he wanted to be proven wrong. And that's the difference. He wanted to be proven wrong. Um, it's a reminder that honest doubt can play an important role in increasing our faith. You know, true faith rarely comes without questions. It, come, it rarely comes without struggle, um, without a sincere search and a longing for the truth. Honest doubt teaches us to stay humble and to learn and to grow. Without these questions, without really examining, we remain babies in our faith. And so the significance of St. Thomas's doubt was that he remained open to God. And immediately he changed his belief when he was proven wrong. He said, my Lord and my God, right? St. Thomas didn't accept the witness of his friends. But when he saw the risen Christ a week later, he immediately believed. And he made this great profession of faith. He said, my Lord and my God. So honest doubt opened the door to an increased faith. And it led him to see his master and his teacher and his Lord and his God, right? And this revelation renewed his faith and it led St. Thomas to travel as far as India to proclaim the good news of the resurrection of Christ. And so I want to, you know, can we say the same thing about the doubts that we harbor in our own hearts, in our own minds? The central question that we all have to ask ourselves is this. Am I sincerely and earnestly searching for answers to my questions and doubts? You know, if doubts, if I have doubts, am I willing to make the efforts needed to search for the truth? It's been said that we need to study heaven, right? Our whole life is focused on heaven. Our eternal life will be in heaven. So we should study it carefully. Uh, for example, you know, if, if somebody was moving to a new city for work, Right? You would know the street names. You would know where the nearest stores are if for relocation. That would be at the top priority. You would know everything about that city. If a student is studying, if they're planning to go to a different place for college or for graduate school or for anything, you would study your options uh, and examine the details to a T. You would know the financial aid status. You would know everything about where you're going. And all of these examples, they fall short. But, you know, we will hopefully be in heaven eternally. So we should study heaven carefully. And we have to look at the facts. Our faith does not fear investigation. Um, Christ is the truth, right? And the more that it's investigated, the more it shines. Our Lord says, reach your finger here, right? Come near, examine every side, enter the depths. There is no conspiracy. There's no brainwashing in the church just revealing truth. And so on a side note, I think it's important to pay attention how the disciples reacted to St. Thomas. You know, how did they react to St. Thomas and his disbelief? Did they cast him out? Did they shun him? Did they excommunicate him? No. We see that even one week later, he is still with them. Despite him being very vocal about, he, he drew the line in the sand. The disciples kept him as part of the community. Um, and we know that because St. Thomas received his call from Christ, not from them. And St. Thomas was chosen by Christ. And though the disciples were, were not able to change his mind, they kept him in the fellowship uh, despite his disbelief. And he was still attracted to Christ and he was still attracted to the followers. It's a lesson for us. How are we to treat those who express doubt and disbelief that are among us, even in our families? Sometimes when the youth have, um, when, they, when the youth start to have these thoughts, uh, sometimes the parents react very harshly as if they are disowning them from their families. We have to be very careful uh, that we don't overreact. We keep, we keep them with patience and we examine every side of the argument. Um, if those who struggle with faith are still willing to come to our fellowship and be numbered among us, we are to welcome them with open arms. 
we have to remember that not everyone has experienced what we have. Not everyone sees what you see in Christ or what you see in the church. Not everyone has experienced what you have. There are other Thomases out there who want to see and who want to believe. And even if we can't bring them to, our, to the faith, at least we can keep them coming until Christ reveals himself to them. Another side note, I, 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 during these times of the Holy 50 Days, we can tend to fall into the trap of, of relaxing spiritually. Please don't miss the blessings of this time. Uh, we had a lot of momentum. A lot of us uh, during Holy Week and, and entering into uh, and finishing Lent and entering to Holy Week, we were on this spiritual high. You know, we were um, praying in our homes like we've never prayed before, especially during the lockdown. Um, we had schedules, we had routines, we had uh, we were sharing responsibilities. The the youth and the kids were being assigned the prophecies and things like that, and we were experiencing. Um, the right to the church in a different level, maybe like we've never had before. And I don't want this time because now we can have any food that we want. There's no restrictions on the fasting. We, we can feel like we are relaxing spiritually, right? St. Thomas missed one meeting and he missed the appearance of the Lord, right? Um, what about us, you know, as, as we reflect on the resurrection and this time of the 50 uh, and I was reflecting on this point about the times that we would gather in the church and, you know, anytime that we come together, what if the Lord appeared to us uh, in the flesh during the liturgy, right? Um, the question is, are we at church or are we coming late? You know, what if he came during Vespers? What if he came during midnight praise or, or Tizbeha? Where, where were we, <laughs> right? And now that we have the, the blessings of the quarantine, I think it reminds us not to take uh, the spiritual matters for granted, not to take church for granted, uh, not to take our prayer life for granted. Um, you know, we have to remember the promises that our Lord has given each one of us. He says that if two or three gather in his name, he will be there. It's a very clear promise. And so the question is, do we gather in his name at home? And are we inviting him in our homes, in our hearts? And so to conclude, the Orthodox Christian faith is unapologetic about its claims for absolute truth found in our Lord Jesus Christ. Every sincere Christian until his or her dying day must remain uh, in pursuit of the absolute truth. The ultimate answers in life and the, the central questions in life exist in Christ. And it exists, the answers exist in our Orthodox Christian worldview. Don't be afraid to ask the questions. Don't be afraid to address the doubts that are lurking in your hearts. Be sincere. Be honest with your doubt. Be sincere with your questions, but be even more sincere about your pursuit for answers. That's more important. St. Thomas faced them, even though he drew the line in the sand. You know, he said what he said. And St. Thomas was not doubting as much as he was choosing. He was making the choice to withhold belief until he had seen it for himself. And I don't think it was a defect in character, but I think it was more about putting on armor. And his only way of protecting himself from yet another wound from his broken heart. Um, he didn't want to be vulnerable again until he had seen it for himself. And so St. Thomas reminds us to go from doubt to faith, to go from ignorance to knowledge, to go from uncertainty to truth. St. Thomas teaches us to take our doubts to the church. Do not abandon your Christian family. Do not retreat from the apostolic community. You know, stay in the church and, and pray privately um, and attend the liturgies whenever we possibly can. And ask Christ to give you the answers and to reveal himself and to bring you the truth. And speak with your father confession, right? Bring these thoughts to your father confession. That's why I wanted to illustrate that point earlier. When, uh, when our Lord Jesus Christ gave the power to forgive sin, you know, and he gave that authority to the disciples. And so if you really want to know the truth, Christ will give it to you. But be clear, you must want to find the truth like a starving man who wants to find food, right? You want to find the truth as if you are a dying man in the desert wanting to find water. You know, if you 
merely wouldn't mind knowing the truth, then, you know, there's no reason that you're going to hear from Christ. You're, you're playing. You're not really being honest with your, with your seeking. God himself promised, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. This is found in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. If you really want to find the truth, Christ will reveal it to you. For everyone who seeks, they find. And so we pray that all doubt is removed and the action of faith will restore us to harmony with God and we will be granted with peace. We pray that we have the peace of the risen Lord Jesus Christ and that we may have a living experience of faith with him so that we too can proclaim my Lord and my God, Christ is risen, truly he is risen and glory be to God forever. Amen. Just a few